go. There you are. So Emma is a University of Calgary alumni. As a child, her favorite pastimes were tromping through the woods, checking out rivers and streams and wetlands. And uh, in April 2020, we had an opportunity to bring her on board as staff after she volunteered for us for several program seasons. And we are ecstatic that she's joined the team. Emma Stroud is our um, citizen science and stewardship coordinator, and her focus is on the vegetation management aspect of the stewardship work that we do. And tonight she's going to be sharing all about how we take care of Fish Creek and update on our expanded stewardship efforts. Thank you so much, Emma. Sweet. Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, uh, just kind of going to jump in here because I know I could probably blab for hours on end about all the different things that uh, that we're doing. And I think I'll probably miss a couple or inadequately uh, address a few couple just because there's so many things that we do. And um, yeah, so I'll do my best to kind of highlight what we're what we're up to. But um, just with everything going on, it's it's you'll have to come out and check it out for yourself, I guess. <laughs> But so as Katie was mentioning, um, Fish Creek does not start uh, right where the park starts. So it actually starts um, a lot further west than us, up kind of by McLean and the eastern slopes of the Rockies. Um, so it travels through a bit of agricultural land, through Titsina Nation, and then it starts uh, through the Fish Creek and meets up with the Bow River, kind of right around Hullswood and Bow Valley Ranch area. And then essentially it flows uh, east, east, east until eventually those waters drain all into the um, like Winnipeg basin and uh, kind of goes straight across the prairies here. So we're definitely um, in a place in the in the province and also just in the in the whole entire country that we're very connected to the watershed. Um, kind of whatever we do in any level throughout uh, our little tiny impact in Fish Creek has implications for for downstream for um, several provinces to, to uh, in fact so it's it's certainly a um, yeah an interesting place to work in and, and a lot of great things coming out of it so just to kind of highlight um, a, a few of our partners sponsors um, our funders that have made a lot of this work that I'm about to touch on possible um, so because I've primarily been coordinating the invasive species management projects um, these are a little bit biased on my project end so I might have missed potentially at one or two for other uh, programs but um, I'm going to essentially talk about kind of all the uh, the upscaled stewardship work that we've been doing in the last couple of years and how we're really keeping track of it and monitoring things and using using our amazing fleet of volunteers and um, and really training them at, at different levels so that they can um, do an amazing uh, amount of work beyond the capacity of what a few of us could do just in the office kind of thing. So um, if people haven't been down to the park, it's um, it's incredibly big. It's uh, one of the biggest parks, if not, I can't remember quite the biggest in North America. Um, so it's about 13 kilometers long and it has 11 residential communities, approximately 6,000 homes bordering onto the park. Um, and from the latest estimates, which were pre-COVID, I believe there is a, a yearly uh, visitation of about 3 million guests. So it's certainly a well-loved, well-traveled, well-used park. And with that comes a lot of um, degradation, a lot of human uh, impacts and big footprints. Um, but yeah, we're kind of, we're really using um, this platform, the GIS kind of platform and photo geolocations, everything like that, to really measure our impact and, um, and, and prove and also kind of determine if we're making a, um, an impact over time and how we can kind of tweak our programs to better reflect what we're trying to do. So there's a ton of things happening in the park and, and yeah, I'll do my best to kind of touch on the main big things, but uh, yeah, I could never probably possibly touch them all in, in 40 minutes or so. So to kind of jump into the main couple that I'm going to touch on is basically um, restoration, poplar regeneration, and invasive species management. So um, the friends have been restoring sections of riparian habitat, which is essentially these um, ideally up to 30 meters, 100 meters, maybe in an ideal situation, sections of vegetation that uh, grows along the creek. So preferentially likes wet soils, things like willows, poplars, um, different shrubs that you might not expect in a grassland. And they're these really important features, um, riparian areas uh, for all sorts of things, controlling flood, 
um, filtering sediment, uh, being good fish habitat, all sorts of things. Um, so the Friends of Fish Creek have been restoring sites for uh, since 2014. Um, and we've now amassed a fleet of sites, um, primarily kind of starting along where we work, primarily out of the East End, kind of in the Bow Valley Ranch. Um, so there's 10 sites in the Bow Valley Ranch, two sites in Hulls Wood, kind of where the Bow, um, where the where Fish Creek meets the Bow River. And then we've endeavored um, east of just east or just west, sorry, of McLeod Trail into Votie's Flats, where we've put a couple new sites there. Um, so the basis that we go on for determining what sites we're going to restore is based on this criteria um, really well fleshed out by Cows and Fish um, organization. So they're one of our amazing uh, partnering organization that comes down and trains um, a, a nice group of volunteers to do riparian health assessments. Um, so these volunteers, they generally pair up with, with somebody and um, they're trained on all sorts of criteria for determining riparian health such as um, it's really good if you have a lot of this big they call it coarse woody debris so stuff like that could be um, can offer different habitats different shelter um, different nutrients to the soil they look for the amount of uh, new vegetation versus decadent old wood that um, that might not be as productive ecologically or as uh, providing some stable roots and whatnot um, and also looking at things like the prevalence of weeds um, the number of of, uh, of native species and things like that. Um, something, another thing that they look for is uh, the instance of compacted ground, which is essentially um, letting you know kind of the human use of that area. So something like this, there's dozens, probably maybe hundreds of access points down to the creek. Um, and beyond just trails that were made kind of in the 70s and uh, by Alberta parks, there's also hundreds of these little braided trails throughout the park um, that are user built or, or potentially mountain bikes or used by used by people in some way. And they're really at risk of degrading and eroding these kind of uh, susceptible banks here that are close to the creek. So um, a site like this that had a lot of that has a lot of compact trails or compact ground, um, not much is going to revegetate there. It's kind of a, an attraction that people might kind of keep coming back to that area. You might see more problems with garbage or um, different things like that. So something like this probably wouldn't receive the best riparian health score. Um, but if it meets other criteria, even things like accessibility for our, um, our trucks to come in and, and drop off supplies and equipment and, and people, um, uh, this could be potentially a really good site to be restored. And it was, which is really nice. So it doesn't look like this anymore. It's all um, uncompacted and, and new vegetation in there to, to kind of support this bank stability and um, yeah, just ensure that uh, not only is it more um, it's stronger in the event of a flood, but it's also just offering the other ecological benefits of, uh, of a healthy native riparian uh, area. Emma, can I interrupt for a second? There, mm, seems to be, there seems to be a sound that everyone else is muted. Um, it might be your, like, your mouse or something. There's like a hitting noise that Weird. some people have been commenting. They're finding it distracting. So just wondering, I don't know. If yeah, I'll see what, there might be like blowing blinds. I can settle that down. I'll see what's up. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. that could be no, no. Thank you for letting me know. That's perfect. We were trying okay. to figure out what that was. A, a I think it was trail. a radiator giving some, no, <laughs> giving some wind to some blinds. So I think, I think we're good now. So okay. thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, essentially each year since about 2014 or so, volunteers have been planting hundreds of native shrubs and trees inside of each of these uh, restoration sites. We usually restore about 50 meters of, of stream bank um, at a time, which can kind of give or take because you sometimes end up being a bit deeper of a site or a bit longer and narrower. So it can be um, a bit give or take on that amount. Um, but we're putting all sorts of native vegetation in there that's going to provide um, good root system and good cover and um, offer some forage for our native herbivores as well. Um, certainly not uh, discouraging them to come in here. We have uh, kind of space under the fencing and stuff like that to encourage mammals, little tiny rodents and stuff to come in and pass the seeds along and stuff like that, but really trying to improve the, um, the ecosystem function by really enhancing the, the shrub and tree complement. 
So some uh, little local poplars, um, Saskatoon and rose bushes. Um, certainly a lot of willows closer to the creek are really good for bank stabilization. Um, and down kind of in our uh, Hullswood site here, so this is just uh, kind of at the, at the end of Bow Bottom Trail before you get to the, um, the boat launch area. Um, so one of these Hullswood sites is a really good example of where we, um, how we use different strategies to close off these trails that we don't want people accessing. So um, similar to the photo that was up above a bit, um, this used to be super, super compacted, was likely a creek access point that people were really drawn to, of course, for its um, kind of natural uh, lack of vegetation here. And it's really made worse by all the people kind of reusing these trails. So we do a couple different things to dissuade people from reusing these. So we'll throw big, huge logs over. Um, this kind of continues all the way up the path. And we'll also chew this whole section up with um, Pulaski's, which is essentially a, a pickaxe kind of axe combination that does a really good job of unpacked, uncompacting the soil and allowing the roots to be able to get in there. So here's one of our um, one of our massive highlights from kind of 2020 forward has been uh, the donation of now two um, uh, watering or what we mainly use for watering trucks, but uh, stewardship vehicles essentially that have been donated by inline pigging. Um, so we've also got a specialized trained uh, crew that is responsible for watering all of these different sites. So understandably, now that we've got uh, I think 13 and counting at least restoration sites going and we've got all the way down to McLeod Trail from from our offices um, this has just absolutely been a game changer and without without the capacity to water and maintain sites especially for the first three years that they're being established there's um, considerably less um, success that you can expect so we uh, yeah we're, we're really thankful for for all of this um, supplemental help to make sure that these these vegetation the root they root and they grow and everything is another kind of inaction watering. Um, and the other thing I guess that we've encountered um, is uh, just in general with the park kind of there's varying habitats, um, ecosystems from super dry grasslands in the park to the riparian areas that get a lot of probably underground percolation and water um, for those, uh, for the plants that we're planting. But there's a lot of areas in the park that are doing really poorly in terms of poplar regeneration. So um, especially primarily down on the east end where it was um, a lot more agriculturally used. Um, a lot of the poplar seedlings aren't able to establish without getting choked out by smooth brome and some um, tall agricultural grasses that essentially don't let them um, have any sunlight and are unable to, um, to grow at all. So one kind of innovative thing that we've been able to do this, um, this past year in 2021 was use these water boxes, which were um, a bit of an impressive feat to track down and get. Um, they were coming from Denmark and not able to, to be acquired here, but um, there's certainly a super intuitive or innovative way to, um, to kind of deal with um, these areas with low poplar regeneration that aren't, um, aren't producing these young, young seedlings. So essentially what these water boxes do is um, the bottom kind of green cut part of it, it has a kind of like a candle wick or a bit of like a rope. Um, and then it you, you start with about four liters, eight liters of water inside that, uh, inside the bowl and it wicks, use that wick to draw uh, water up to the, to the little sapling there. And the base also kind of provides a secondary uh, help with suppressing weeds around it so that you kind of, you give that little sapling a leg up and a lot better of a chance to, to grow with all this um, competing brome around here is pretty much no chance. Um, so here's, uh, here's people, nice volunteers uh, putting in all of our water boxes. It was certainly uh, a, a, an added step. And as you can see with these milk jugs, it required a, um, it required a, a bit of an innovative uh, hack to, to transport the water down there because um, these essentially were only going into the sites that, uh, that are unable to be trucked in water. So we had to get pretty, uh, pretty creative and fill 
um, upwards of 50 uh, jugs of water and truck them in and, and haul them in. So volunteers are just unbelievably helpful with that, um, with that work. And the milk jug was kind of a creative solution, especially because this way we can really accurately track how much water each tree is getting and, um, and give them kind of each uh, the same fighting chance in this. And that's just filling those all up. <laughs> Uh, so, like I said, we expanded to um, to just west of McLeod, down in Vautier's Flats. Um, and part of the really cool part about this, not only is only made possible with uh, with our trucks and our watering crew, um, but it's also really uh, really serendipitously aligned with the master trails plan that Alberta Parks has been contracting through um, O2 planning and design. Um, and we we're fortunate enough to see some amazing kind. Of sneak peek data from the landscape. Uh, I think she was a landscape ecologist or landscape architect realm of things. Um, and essentially this a mass of data that um, has been collected from each and every trail, whether it's a, a formal trail, a paved trail, a gravel trail, mountain bike, user-built trail, um, every single graded trail through, throughout the park and essentially categorized based on um, the potential for erosion or um, falling into the creek. That's actually happened quite a few times in um, with the instance of either paved trails just being uh, potentially built too close to the creek or um, the creek kind of desires what the creek desires. And, and if it wants to expand in a flood year, it might just take that path with it. So part of this master trails plan um, through Alberta Parks has been, um, is really looking at which paths um, should maybe be decommissioned and chewed up and planted kind of uh, use us to enhance the native uh, native plant diversity and stabilize some of those areas. Um, and so we've kind of been using uh, not only the, the riparian health assessments that volunteers are coming in, but also aligning those with uh, the master trails um, work that is some, some kind of smaller scale things that don't require excavators um, that can be done by hand tools and volunteers. So a couple of those were down in Vautier's flats and some really beautiful sites um, that are super heavily compacted, super eroded, tons of braided networks of, uh, of trails and stuff. So part of the stuff that we do, um, chewing up this path with the Pulaski's and shovels and stuff like that, and then placing, um, with the help of cows and fish uh, specialties, placing these plants kind of uh, with how they, how they would be naturally spaced in the canopy. And we actually put in some spruce trees down here too, because there's a lot more, as you can kind of see in the background, there's some native um, spruce and that kind of ecosystem that would be more favorable than, than some poplars. So, um, yeah, and then preparing these, uh, the water jugs were a really good way to get them wetted and um, immediately kind of ready to grow and establish. So again, as you can kind of see here, there's kind of this path remnant um, that's going to be completely planted and, and hopefully covered, covered up nicely and vegetated in the next couple of years. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we're still in the process of refining this technique, but we've been using this platform in a combination of um, tagging the actual vegetation uh, with, we're using metal washers right now, which we've come into a, of quite a few obstacles with ink rubbing off and permanent not being so permanent, but um, I think we're we've probably hopefully nailed down a technique this year to really well track and monitor these, um, the health of each individual uh, tree and, and bush that we've been planting. So essentially they have, they each have a tag that has a number on it and that specific um, ID has a geolocation that we're uploading into our field map database um, and each of those has um, a condition, a potential, if they are missing a tree cage, they have that option for somebody to select. Um, and rolling out hopefully this year will be uh, a really nice organized effort to um, really, really better maintain and, uh, and do some things like pruning or fence repair or um, just little weeding maintenance kind of things that, that will hopefully get these guys um, just that much better chance of, of surviving in the long term. These are just kind of what they look like once it's all done. So this would have been a really flat, compacted uh, piece of piece of trail here that was not meant to be there, way close to the creek. Um, and afterwards, it's it's been chewed up. The we've got native plants in there with tree cages, and they're tagged and mapped. 
Um, and then we've got a bunch of mulch over top and some kind of coarse woody debris that we've thrown on, thrown around just to um, kind of increase the nutrients and, um, and everything like that. Um, one of our also really exciting new partnerships was through Tree Canada. Um, so Tree Canada, we got uh, help with the Tremendous Grant. Uh, I can't believe that I can't recall the exact wording of it, but something about the Tremendous uh, Tree Planting Grant. Um, so we were able to plant a couple extra hundred uh, uh, poplars right around the Bow Valley Ranch um, using those water boxes uh, technique to, to kind of expand how far we can uh, plant away from the creek and still have them successful and, and viable. So this is us um, all being uh, trained on some, some techniques that even us who'd been planting trees for quite a few years had never heard of some of these genius, uh, genius planting techniques that Tree Canada taught us. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to, I guess, just seeing how these establish um, potentially the, the comparison between these and, and the last years, who knows if some, some of these little tricks have uh, um, really supplemented this, the, their survival, but super fun day and lots of, lots of hands on deck uh, going into the hundreds and hundreds of, of trees we've been, we've been planting. Um, so kind of to just back up um, for where we get our native shrubs and trees. Um, so we get a, we have a local supplier out by Oak Totes, which is five star trees that um, is a really great sponsor and gives us great deals on all of our local vegetation here. So we get all our narrow leaf cottonwood poplars and balsam poplars and Saskatoons and, and all the sort from there. Um, and we also do, we take live uh, willow stake cuttings out from, from Legacy Island, which is a conservation site that Trout Unlimited takes care of um, out by Cars Land. So those are some, some big highlights definitely from, from the year collecting, just going to this amazing, the prairies just open up to, to something you never would have thought would be there. Um, and, and so close downstream within our watershed and, and stuff. So super nice to kind of have the full circle of taking things from super close and uh, planting them back where they can regenerate and, and do really good things for us. Here's just a nice whack of volunteers last year harvesting willows. Um, there's gonna be a lot more going on uh, in that department this year. Um, uh, if for people, for anyone who might not know, willows are amazing regenerators. Um, along with a very few willows are definitely the best. Very few other ones, like um, a couple poplars, can be successful at this as well uh, as well as red osier dogwood. Um, you can cut basically the best time is when they're dormant, so kind of October, November, that kind of time of year before it's really freezing. Um, you can cut these uh, these live plants right from the base, and then out of one long six foot uh, stake, you could maybe get two. Um, uh, kind of shorter stakes and you you pound them into the to the ground um, ideally kind of as close to the aquifer close to the creek as you can um, and then they are amazing at establishing their own root system and the next season you can hopefully expect to see them sprouting and uh, and rooted so pretty uh, incredible uh, just bioengineering feat and we definitely use that wherever we can um, in the creek to, to offer some watershed resilience and, and stability. Um, we also get incredible help from our friends up the hill um, on Bow Bottom Trail at the, the Venturers Society. Um, they're a really amazing organization that works a lot outdoors, um, doing several countless things in the park. Um, but one of the amazing things that they do, they have a, um, a massive greenhouse kind of nursery that they raise uh, native native flowers and plants in. And what they've also taken on is we, um, we give them uh, our, some of our vegetation and they take care of it for a long, for until we need it. So essentially they're, um, they might be watering it every day or pruning it, kind of looking after it um, along with uh, some of our interns and people that we um, put on that, <laughs> that may be devastating uh, a task all summer, but um, without them, we would definitely not be able to uh, kind of keep an eye on all this and, and prevent us from having to do multiple deliveries all through the season um, rather than just kind of one. So this is them helping out and unloading this 
hundreds of, of plants from, um, from the trucks, transplanting them into these native beds. And then uh, eventually in the fall, um, we put them in our restoration sites. So these are a couple of um, our heroes this year that helped out with various planting missions. Um, we had a incredible support from uh, youth organizations this year. Uh, one of the really miraculous things about um, kind of this organization and this work that we're doing uh, during COVID has been, um, it hasn't been as challenging as I think a lot of industries have faced. Um, we've been really, really lucky to be able to pretty much do a lot of this work or a lot of, um, at least a lot of kind of the weed stuff and all this stuff. Uh, we've been able to pretty successfully do it um, at a distance and maybe, maybe a bit less um, partner focused and more independent and spaced out. But we've been really lucky to be able to engage um, so many youth. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of hours from youth last year and um, just amazing that we could still get out there and do stuff and, and get outside and connect while still um, not having many uh, COVID concerns with just being outside and, and distanced and not really interfering. So these are just some more volunteers getting the, getting the plants in the ground. Um, uh, there's so many other groups. Rotary Club was one of the um, another highlight that supplied uh, funding and a quite a few days of, um, of stewardship work in, in restoration, in, um, in beaver tree wrapping and stuff like that. So um, really nice to make all sorts of connections and really harness um, our ability to kind of connect and engage and, and get big groups to do a ton of work. Um, kind of before heading on to the weed section, there's countless, as I said, so many different things going on. Um, and another thing to kind of highlight before uh, moving on too much. And luckily, Katie mentioned that she's uh, hopefully going to talk a little bit more about this in an upcoming speaker series or newsletter. Um, but uh, very commendable, amazing work being done in the beaver coexistence realm. Um, so a lot of interpretive signage got installed, I think three signs down in uh, Marshall Springs, where um, the pond levelers, five pond levelers I believe now are installed to um, properly maintain all the the over or the stormwater overflow um, uh, essentially draining these beaver ponds um, but it, but still allowing the beavers to to be there and inhabit these sites um, and the signage is just an absolute kind of the icing on the cake to make sure that people are aware of what's going on and um, we've already seen uh, just anecdotally volunteers have seen people uh, actively reading the signs and stuff. So they've done an amazing job and without probably spoiling too much of her um, potential next hopeful little sneak peek. Um, yeah, they've been doing great stuff down there and hopefully some more um, interesting beaver coexistence stuff to come. So I'm just gonna switch over to my weed uh, management presentation. Um, so just make, let me know if you cannot see it, but otherwise I'll kind of just assume that we're good it's to good. go. It's good. Good? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, just, sweet. <laughs> can I just correct one thing about the beaver project? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are not that. draining wetlands. I know that photo, yes. <laughs> that photo looks like the wetland behind, um, Himanchu, who is at the sign that he just installed. It looks like that wetland is, is dry. And, and that one is, that's a, that's a, there you go. That's a funny, that's a funny wetland. It goes dry and goes wet. It's like, it's the beaver's reserve and the beavers sometimes dig out the channel and let the water out and we're not exactly sure why or what's happening there but we've like we've confirmed with the city of Calgary that they're not the ones that are draining it and that like it looks like beavers are actually draining their own wetlands at times but essentially what these pond levelers do and there is one in the background of that picture but it's kind of hard to see um what the pond leveler does is just take the water level down enough that it's not flooding the nearby pathway and it still leaves the beavers enough water to survive so this particular pond is not their main pond that their lodge is on it's a secondary pond and it's actually part of the city of calgary's stormwater disposition so this water fluctuates with stormwater um and so this is a more dry time and there's evidence of kids getting in there when the when the pond is dry and building forts out of all the sticks and then the water comes in you're like who built a log cabin in the middle of the yeah. pond? <laughs> it's really interesting. And we'll be hosting lots of tours down in that area this coming summer. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, come to one of our tours. Definitely recommend those. It's the coolest, it's the strangest lagoon, like different world situation down there. So totally, if you can check it out, because it's, it's so, so interesting down there. 
But yeah, so kind of trying to go move on to the uh, our vegetation management. Um, so I've talked a couple times about this throughout the last couple of years. So hopefully this isn't uh, this isn't old information to many people, but some really really exciting things that we're scaling up um, beyond kind of what we've been doing in the last in the last little bit. So. Um, these are essentially our um, our three project sites um, that we're uh, really, really increasing our vegetation management on. So for those who might be familiar with the park, these are um, kind of in the, from the most west site there, that's uh, in the community of Midnapore Sundance. So it's, it's essentially this six, six acre plot of land that used to be used for haying in the park when it was when it was a farm. And then there's this thick kind of band of aspen trees that's maybe a hundred meters thick that then leads kind of into the valley of Fish Creek. So um, this really amazing, um, I'll go into it a bit later, but a community group that's kind of um, keeping things in control over there. And then the middle site there is the Atco Heritage Grassland, which um, all sorts of really cool things, um, primarily uh, a grassland ecosystem down there. So there's um, lots of different grass management and, um, and native prairie uh, kind of establishment that we're trying to achieve down there. And then the last site down kind of in the south on the east corner there is a really interesting mix between kind of a grassland wetland mix ecosystem and we're trying to manage a prohibited noxious weed spotted knapweed out of there which um, parks uh, as essentially the land manager has an obligation to to get rid of so lots of um, kind of high stakes projects uh, and uh, really exciting things that our volunteers get to get to be a part of. Um, we're also really making an exciting foray into biological monitoring. Um, so biological control uh, without kind of yammering on and on and on because it's one of the probably most exciting things um, kind of in the uh, in the frontier of uh, invasive species management. Um, biological control essentially is uh, primarily insects um, in our application that are uh, that evolved or come from the same space. There's the same exact location that the invasive species came from. So for example, if it's Canada thistle, we have a, a very specific Aww. insect that feeds just on Canada thistle um, that uh, evolved in the same space and um, is supposedly uh, usually doesn't make it over here at the same time that the thistle did. So we have the invasive weed, but we don't have the, the control organism, organism that um, controls its population. So um, yeah, we've been doing a bunch of different kind of amalgamating uh, different uh, data sets that have been um, that different releases have been happening in the in the park for decades that uh, the data maybe hasn't been tracked as well as as it could be. So this has been a really great um, the mapping tool, especially a good way to track all of this data um, from cross organizations and kind of put it in in one centralized place. Um, and kind of the, the other really exciting bit that we're um, that we're looking into is uh, kind of our happy spaces of where are the the native grassland rem grassland remnants, um, pristine patches that that we can kind of work to um, expand and buffer out of um, maybe transplant from, collect seeds from, or um, essentially just create, make them bigger so that we can kind of um, really start tackling this invasive species battle and, and offer some really good competitors to, um, to get these invasive species out. Um, so kind of as I was touching on, um, a lot of what has gone into a lot of this work and mapping um, any of these projects is kind of combining all the data and tracking down all the data from so many different sources throughout the years um, and putting it into a single digital database. And part of that is, is, is especially hard because um, a lot of the times there's discrepancies or differences in how people track data, what they're recording, um, photos, where the data is, what format it is in. So sometimes it could be paper maps that you're transcribing with inaccurate data points or GPS data, um, the ideal form being shape files that we can kind of instantly download. Um, but there's so many data, uh, so many pieces of data and studies from so many different sources. Um, 
And it's just been super illuminating and kind of um, hopeful to put them all uh, into this map to kind of see. Uh, it's not just a sad story of these fields of, of brome and spurge and toe flax and all the stuff that we're dealing with, but there's lots of studies and lots of research um, from, from various people that um, have highlighted some really uh, special places worth protecting and kind of worth uh, us checking out and, and seeing what's going on. So I'm going to kind of quickly blow through um, our main project areas and other kind of things that we're um, doing in the vase of species realm. Um, so the first one being the Atco Heritage Grassland. So if people are familiar with the Bow Valley Ranch, the um, super expensive fancy restaurant uh, just north of the site, there's a big red barn as well. So kind of a familiar um, central location, main entrance point into the park. Um, and in 2016, there was a, a high pressure gas line that needed to be um, installed into this kind of uh, grassland section here. Um, so prior to this installation, um, you weren't, uh, this wasn't being ripped up. It wasn't necessarily a very pristine um, native patch that was being ripped up. It was essentially um, all around this is uh, pretty much a brome and timothy grass um, agricultural crop monocultures that would have been used um, in the grazing days when this was uh, when 4,000 head of cattle were were grazing through this area. So um, essentially this pipe was was put in and if you kind of keep an eye on the back telephone poles you can see uh, it's the same angle you're looking at. So for, for reference if you just kind of keep an eye on the background there uh, same telephone poles here. So this is kind of what we're looking at um, 2016, 2017, pretty scrubby kind of lots of bare ground, not some, uh, not very established native grasses by any means at all. So a lot of invasive species to deal with. Um, and what we're looking at now kind of in comparison is uh, a lot of these uh, little native um, forbs that are coming in, um, really good native grass establishment. So we've got um, porcupine grass especially is coming in really nicely. Um, some plains rough fescues populating nicely. Um, some, some flax and blue-eyed grass that's coming in and the odd rows or two. So it's looking pretty good and starting to, um, to assemble more of a native, well, more of a native grassland or modified grassland than, than for sure it was in the, in the past. Um, and what's really promising and really, really nice, especially if you catch it in the right, um, the right time of year, you can see a really nice visual comparison. So this being taken in, uh, in I believe late September, probably given the, the tree coloring. Um, and on the right, you can see is the outside of perimeter of the grassland. And that's pretty much a brome monoculture. So you can kind of see the um, red colors, um, autumn colors of the brome grass. And on the left is inside the perimeter of the grass line, which has been reseeded. And you can really, uh, really see that difference. It's, it's super blonde. It's a lot more heterogeneous. There's more habitat diversity, um, more potential for things to grow and not just be, um, brome is a super tall, fast, early season growing grass. So it pretty much doesn't allow competitors um, any chance of establishment inside, inside those uh, monocultures. Um, so the, the grasses that were put in um, back in 2016 were uh, sand reed grass, northern wheat grass, june grass, plains rough fescue, porcupine grass, and needle and thread grass, um, all of which were present this year um, during a rangeland health assessment, and uh, which was really exciting to know that um, they've successfully established and the rangeland ecologist was super impressed actually with the with the native take up and an absence of of open ground areas so it was nice to kind of have some positives about five years into the project um but the the uh the other side of things is there's still a lot of weeds so um we've been we've had manual hand pulling volunteers um dedicated to this plot about once a week in the weed season for the last since it was it was reseeded in 2016 um but it's still there's still uh just for whatever reason being disturbed soil and ability to colonize and it have it being very modified all around it there's um there's certainly no lack of weeds um still five years in so um, primarily we're looking at things that would have been used for agricultural forage, so things like timothy grass, 
um, brome grass, which is uh, weirdly pretty in its flowering state, but um, quite a pain in the butt to, to manage, especially it produces um, with rhizomes and creeps and um, remains dormant its seeds in the in the seed bank in the soil for 10 years plus. So um, a really horrible wheat uh, invasive agricultural invasive to deal with and also um, for comp native competitors uh, the ecological functions is is like 180 different the um, the lack of water retention and and soil stability that Rome and Timothy gives is just uh, just nothing compared to the native plants so really trying to get rid of those ones um, and then we've got our noxious weeds that um, are prevalent in various areas of the park. Um, so yellow toad flax, Canada thistle, um, uh, we've got white cockle and different things like that. Um, so one of the uh, things that we've encountered with, with such an upscale, um, not only not just going from um, light hand tools and, and manual hand pulls, but kind of increasing to um, weed whippers and chemical application, we've run into the instance that um, uh, the necessity to get um, professional wildlife biologists, uh, consultants in here to do pre-disturbance nest searches. So this was one of the massive highlights of my summer, just um, from a learning potential, just so much, uh, so many different cool things that they're um, learning from, from these guys surveying birds, but um, a super important necessary thing for us to uh, prevent any disturbance or harm or unnecessary deaths or, or um, damage to nests uh, that we don't know about. So um, a couple times, I believe, uh, maybe about two times per project area on average, they came out um, between April and, and the end of August, which is the breeding bird window for uh, this area in Alberta. Um, we sent, they sent us some uh, wildlife biologists and, and they would do these um, super thorough searches of, of our project sites um, and kind of a, an extensive buffer around them to make sure uh, and flag any, any birds essentially and send us a memo uh, report kind of thing for where they are. And from that, we were able to um, kind of track these, uh, put them on a map, a big disturbance kind of buffer area, and ensure that uh, our weed whipping crews and herbicide applicators um, and even hand pullers um, avoided those areas and probably uh, on average about 30 to 50 meters um, buffer zones around from each of those nests. So it really did a, a big thing for us to kind of feel a bit more, um, uh, feel our morals aligned with uh, with everything we're doing and, and not uh, not harm anything unnecessarily. It's It was nice to get in there and <clears throat> flag off uh, birds, even if it, it caused us to uh, not treat some of the weeds that we might have wanted to treat at the specific timing. So that's us. Um, our fantastic volunteer, uh, Alan Lamb, took uh, amazing photos kind of documenting our entire process with Stantec and kind of throughout the veg management uh, project with other um, other of the projects. So really nice to see kind of these professional photos and, and nice things to show people. Um, some of the things we discovered, a lot of savanna sparrow nests being quite a uh, grassland environment and really nice to see that they were using um, the kind of heterogeneic features of the Atco grassland, the variable heights in the grasses and different plants that were there, um, as opposed to the bro monoculture, which kind of offered no nesting spots for them and no vantage points and stuff. So a um, couple of strategies that we used kind of throughout our veg management areas, um, weed whipping, we would do that pre-flowering uh, so that nothing would go to seed and, and regenerate on us. We still use hand pulling, especially for things that are close to native plants or close to areas that we don't want to treat with herbicide or um, damage with uh, with kind of higher disturbance things. We still definitely use a lot of hand pulling and um, seed head cutting, stuff like that. Um, and another really cool thing is uh, specifically in the perimeter of the grassland, um, nowhere else in the bro monoculture, um, 
is all of these really nice cottonwood poplars that have been um, able to grow because they're not shaded out by the brown. So we've been able to harvest, I think about 70 on average for the last couple of years uh, out of the grassland. And then we grow them in the nursery, help, uh, helped out by the ventures and people watering them. And then we transplant them uh, close to the creek where they're gonna be nice and successful and, and uh, hold the roots in the bank uh, and, kind of help us on the erosion control battle uh, closer to the creek in restoration season. We also do a lot of native seed collecting where we can and when it's kind of um, when it's uh, feasible and, and not not too crazy to uh, to collect enough seed um, and then just spreading it kind of on all those disturbed patches where we've removed poplars or removed um, weeds and stuff like that. Um, so like I mentioned, we've been using biocontrol, uh, a couple different ones, but the primary one is yellow toad flax weevils and leafy spurge beetles. So we've released them in a couple different of our sites um, with kind of preliminary, really promising results. Um, herbicide application, we're doing really nice selective um, herbicide application that um, specifically targets um, the, the weed and nothing else. Um, it, they're sometimes even specific to uh, broadleaf plants rather than grass, so we kind of have no risk of killing our the native grasses that we're trying to keep um, keep protected. Um, and some of the preliminary results are looking really good. So we're getting uh, galling formed on the toe flax that we've uh, released our weevils in, um, which is those are all their eggs in there. So hopefully this season they've lasted the winter. And really looking forward to getting. Um, we've got a a uh, crew of biocontrol monitoring volunteers kind of um, protocol being developed and volunteers kind of in the wings to, um, to lead that monitoring program. Um, and you can see they're doing really good work. They're kind of creating this, this foliage damage and, and doing great things. So um, being conscious on time, I know we've only got five minutes and need to get some questions in and stuff. So um, just gonna super quick, these are just good talk about everything for days on end. Um, but some more highlights are, um, we've got some amazing community volunteers up on Sun Valley Drive, just a uh, little ways away from the Atco grassland there. Um, and they've been incredible helping out. Uh, they've got ride on a ride on mower that um, every single week from May until September, they were um, mowing about uh, an acre or two to control um, not only the brome and, and the seed source uh, for that and leafy spurge and toad flax and, and uh, thistle and stuff. So um, yeah, just the, the amazing potential that we've been able to um, train people at kind of this higher level where they know how to avoid things and they know um, they know these uh, very specific veg management strategies and, and the mapping aspect is is incredible at, at allowing us to track this kind of thing over time. So uh, the weed watcher kind of program is the one last thing that I'm just going to quickly mention. Um, the weed watchers has been probably the one of the most fun things to be able to um, increase our capacity. Uh, so prior to this last 2021, essentially, um, Alberta Parks through us uh, was offered or was giving very specific people um, who might have really good botany experience or um, kind of grandfathered through um, special permission essentially to pull weeds on a unsupervised basis. So um, these people could make, if they had really good species ID, they could pull spotted knapweed for us, um, but they uh, they kind of wanted to get away from doing um, special permissions and we thought it would be a good time to kind of uh, create this official program that really outlined, um, hit the safety home and hit uh, plant identification, weed identification, um, kind of covered all the basics. We got these uh, uh, we created an amazing program um, with, the, with Megan Evans through the Alberta Invasive Species Council, um, along with some amazing support and um, knowledge and a bunch of just information sharing for, from several other partners. But we developed this really cool program to train um, 20, essentially uh, 10 teams of weed watchers that um, know 40 of our uh, 
primary of concern species specific to Fish Creek. So ones that were either um, defined by concerns that are uh, prevalent in the city of Calgary that we might want to keep an eye on, or they're prohibited noxious ones that we want to destroy on site, essentially. Um, so these people were outfitted with uh, uh, big old kits with shovels and tools and weed bags um, and ID booklets and stuff. And essentially after this, they were allowed to um, submit their weed observations. We reviewed them to ensure that it was a weed and not something that we wanted to keep around. Um, and then they could go remove it, uh, drop it off, collect it, bag it in a, in a bag that doesn't escape the weeds and drop it off at a weed collection site uh, for us to um, for the city of Calgary to dispose of safely. So um, through all of these things, again, I could probably, this is maybe even half of, a, of, of, of kind of what I have um, prepared, which I've prepared for other presentations. So it's not, not lost by any means, but um, yeah, that's kind of a, almost a sneak peek is, uh, is pretty much what it can be um, of all the stewardship stuff and all the exciting things going on. Um, we have just recently hired Dylan, who was who had uh, who was with us in the summer as an intern, um, and he's fielding all the poplar regeneration and restoration stuff. So um, we're going to be charging along with all of that this season. Um, we're also part of the two billion trees campaign, I believe. Uh, planting trees is kind of going gung ho uh, through through eternity in the park, I, I suppose. So lots of things to come and lots of ways to get involved if, if anyone sees any of these interesting and there's lots more of, of these types of opportunities and um, potential to collaborate and kind of expand our capacity. So if you wanna get involved, certainly jump on in because there's uh, pretty much starting in April, uh, there's, there's things uh, that we're just gonna be crazy doing straight through the year. So yeah, that's that's pretty much all I've got, but hopefully we can sneak in a couple questions if people can stay a couple extra minutes. Thank you so much, Emma. I mean, yeah. I work with you and I'm aware of the brand, but I learned a ton tonight. So thank you awesome. so much. Yeah, and I love, love seeing those little weevil eggs in the stem of yeah. that. Oh yeah. Cool. It's so exciting. I haven't seen any questions, but I have seen some comments.